So Margaret gave us a charge there, make sure we still teach this stuff, um, protect our wonderful settlement houses, and help them advocate for the entities that fund them. Um, yesterday I went down to the county for a bidders meeting about the money that the settlement houses can get for doing child welfare work. And um, just in terms of Margaret's point about advocacy, I went because as an MSAS professor, I can sit in the front row and I can say, you guys need to do this or the settlement houses can't do their job because I'm not funded by the county. I don't work for the county, but I can use my authority as a MSAS professor to say, if you want them to take care of kids who are aging out of care, you've got to tell them before the kids age out uh, that those kids are coming to their community. Because in their database, they don't know. So when kids age out of care, somebody needs to ask them, where do you plan to go now? Because um, if we don't ask them, we don't know. If we don't know, we can't plan accordingly. So these settlement houses are willing to be a support for that kid <clears throat> once they relocate to, let's say, Mount Pleasant. But they can't help that kid unless they know. And we don't want to wait until the kid goes to Mount Pleasant and bombs out and then calls the settlement house. We want the settlement house to know this kid, when he gets out of foster care, wants to return to his community, which he defines as Mount Pleasant. So then I want to tell Murtis Taylor, which is not really a settlement house, it's, it's more of a mental health agency, but it, it has settlement house-like qualities. Um, this kid is returning to your community after being in foster care for many years. As a result, we didn't teach him how to do laundry, how to get a bank account, how to look for a job. So he's going to need a lot of support. You guys, please provide that support. And the county will pay Murtis Taylor and others like them to do that. But my point was, well, they can't do that job unless they ask the kids where they want to go and set it up. Um, so, Margaret, we still have settlement houses in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. We have friendly in settlement. And so after the bidders conference, I went to lunch with Friendly Inn Settlement, East End Neighborhood House, West Side Community House. We still have those places to assure them that you can still get these county funds to do child welfare work. You, you, can, you can do this work. And when they asked me like what they should do, I said, well, if you're going to do parenting classes, please also have a group component. You know, so we do still do some of the, so Anna endowed this lectureship to make sure we wouldn't forget this stuff, but we haven't. And so I've asked my two colleagues here to talk about the courses they teach and to assure all the group workers out there, and now you know we're all group workers, right? Um, you, can't get a, you can't get a degree out of SAS without taking a course on, on task groups. And, and I was just checking with Kathy Farkas because she's chair of our alcohol and other drug concentration. And I had heard that they have to take groups, but they don't have to. She said they're strongly encouraged, which is what we do with children and family kids, too. I mean, concentrators, too. So we strongly encourage our students to take Nancy's class. They have to take a class that Mark designed. And the ones that aspire to do community change have to take Mark's other class, where I'm sure he teaches some of this stuff. So I just want them to talk about what they teach. And then we're going to ask you to talk in small groups, because this is small groups, right? Talk in small groups about how you use small groups to do social change. And Mark's going to say a few words about Grace Coyle's advice about how to do that. And then we'll be done. And, and then we'd like you to feed back, what did you talk about in terms of this discussion around using groups for social change? And we'll take questions at that time as well. So I'll ask Margaret to come back up. So uh, a little bit from our panel, and then a little time for you guys to talk amongst yourselves, and then some big group discussion. Does that sound good? All right. OK. All right, thank you. Thank you. 
And maybe I can go first because I think uh, Nancy's the group work expert that's going to help us uh, go into greater detail. It's great to be here. And uh, I'm uh, a 2003 uh, PhD graduate of this program uh, here at, at MSAS. And um, I thought I would start by just saying a little bit about myself because I was, I was really drawn by Margaret's background and, and, and presentation. And one of the things we haven't talked as much about today is, that I think is central to group work, and that is the sense of community and the, the power of community. So uh, my dad grew up Amish, which is an intentional community. And as a young college uh, radical, I joined a Christian uh, intentional community and lived where we shared all of our income and lived in households and met in small groups. Um, every week, shared a meal together. And if you left the community, you actually wrote a separation letter to every member of your small group um, as, a, as a practice. And so it was, it was what I learned about how I learned about community and, and what it means to be community. Um, and I also, like Margaret, I discovered that social work is really the, the key or if not only discipline that focuses equally on personal problems and social issues. And so as the chair of the Community Practice for Social Change concentration, our macro concentration here, I believe that we do that. Um, uh, and we do it in, in, in our direct practice as well. There's this blending of working on personal problems and social issues. So in our, to say a little bit about uh, a, a couple of our classes where we do that is, as David mentioned, the uh, 478, uh, the macro foundation skills for working with communities, organizations, and groups um, course has a, a, a component on group work. And we focus on task groups, and we look at uh, stages of group development, how to work at differences and resolve conflict and build teams and, and create collaboration in that process. Um, and they do a community assessment in groups, and then they write a reflection paper on their group experience that is basically three uh, journal entries. And so they're, they're, they're learning about groups. They're practicing uh, uh, in groups to accomplish their assignment. And then they're reflecting on that as a written assignment. And uh, I, I know it, it, it's powerful and it works because I had a second year student come to me uh, and complain uh, one, one time and said, I'm in, so in my second year course, we do group work, as we do in much of our classes. We do small groups uh, to accomplish projects and assignments. And he said, my group isn't working, and the problem is there's advanced standing students in my group, and they don't know how to work in groups because they didn't take 478. Um, and I think that's actually, and I've heard it from our graduates as well, that when they get into their organizations, they use those skills in working in an agency. These are direct practice students as well as macro students. And so they learn the power and the skills of group work, and they apply that to teams they're on in their organization, coalitions they work on. So it becomes a very central part of their practice as a social worker, apart from therapeutic groups that they might lead. And so it's a, it's a key essential component to that. The second uh, course we do that I teach is uh, organizing and uh, a course on assessing, building, and organizing community. And we also have uh, group projects there and, and, and working in groups. But the piece to that that I want to bring is this notion of building community and how do you build community. So we model that in the course. We, have, uh, we sit in a circle. We use a talking stick, as, as David mentioned earlier. And uh, we do a check-in at every class. Um, and it's a, it's a practice that is so basic, but students say, I, I feel like I count. Um, I, 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 it, my voice matters. The other thing that happens is we do often do check-ins, especially about this time of the year when the semester is really ramping up, to find out how they're, how they're managing all of the stress of field and uh, uh, class work and sometimes outside employment. So, so we, we are able to assess how they're doing in a very quick way. We also teach them about community building techniques of uh, uh, using small groups as a way of uh, addressing social issues. And then in the organizing, obviously, organizing is all about um, um, 
about uh, working in groups. And one of the things, I don't know if Margaret said it as clearly as she did in her prepared remarks, what's the difference between a group worker and a community organizer? And Margaret believes there isn't a difference. They're one and the same, and I, and I think that's true. Um, and so we teach gr uh, community organizing and how to organize small groups of people to make a difference in the world. Um, one of the, a couple other things I just wanted to mention that, uh, and then I'll let Nancy speak. The, the, some of our uh, best practices, one of the things that we say is, well, settlement houses aren't doing some of this and some of the others have kind of, the group work's kind of fallen off, but it's also surged in new ways. And so I don't want us just to say we're continuing to do that same old thing. We've, there's new practices that are emerging. So one of those, and i um, proud to say that there are graduates leading this charge, is the work at Neighborhood Connections. And so Neighborhood Connections uses group work in all of the ways. They call it uh, community network organizing, but it's a group work process. And so they uh, have monthly meetings around the city uh, where um, 30 to 50 people come together on a monthly meeting and they start in a big group in a circle, but then at one point, one of the practices they use is called business of the network. And so uh, uh, four or five people will say, I wanna talk about this issue tonight. Uh, and so I would like to lead a conversation. And what those issues are, interestingly enough, might be, um, school is starting and I have to think about childcare again and I don't know how to provide adequate childcare after school when I have transportation needs and a, a limited budget. And so people will come together and resource each other around something very personal. Other people will say, I'm really concerned about police community relations in this African American neighborhood. What can we do to address that? And so people will come together around that. So they meet together, they discuss that, they resource each other. It's uh, uh, largely self-facilitated. And when there is an issue that needs greater attention, Neighborhood Connections has devised something, what they call action clinics. And so any, that group that comes together that wants to do further work and actually get organized and do action around that will then form We'll meet as a separate time, and with coaching from the staff, we'll do uh, a strategy development. And so it's, it's working on both personal uh, problems and societal issues. Um, so that's a really, that's a really powerful tool. Uh, and then uh, the last thing I just want to make sure I, I say is that I also direct something called the Community Innovation Network, which is a, an, an effort to bring communities and practitioners together to address uh, common interests and needs and, and issues. And so that work we're focusing now is on bridging the divide uh, that in polarized society. And so we have a number of practices that we're promoting in there and we're doing training around that. But one of the initiatives is actually looking at that right here at Case Western. And so we're working with Dion Bradas from the Government and Community Relations Office here on campus to bridge the divide between this campus and our surrounding neighborhoods. And so we're, we're doing service learning on that. We're doing sustained dialogue on that. And sustained dialogue on campus here is a formal five-step process that uses small groups to do that. And so we're, we're using a small group sustained dialogue process because some of these issues can't be resolved in one community meeting. Um, many of them can't. So we need a sustained effort. So sustained dialogue is an effort to meet over a semester, over a, an entire academic year, and the five-step process really addresses root causes and identifies stakeholders, and then arises its strategies and action. So, so those are some of the things we're doing here on campus and in our community to pr promote groups. Okay, okay, well thank you, Mark. So, and so just to highlight, again, if Anna's listening, you can't get out of MSAS without taking that 478 class unless, of course, you're advanced standing, as Mark yeah. pointed out. So they all get that, and then if they choose to do community change work, they get Mark's talking stick. Yeah. <laughs> so they will get group work. And then if they're doing uh, school social work, we have our school social work folks in the room, mm -hmm. or alcohol and other drug, they are strongly encouraged to take Nancy's class. And so I've asked Nancy to talk and so Nancy called me, what? Re I'm sorry, school social workers are required to take Nancy's class. 
Because we're, we're sorry, we're we're doing academic advising right now, so we got to make sure we're all singing from the same hymnal. All okay. So as all students are strongly encouraged. practice are as well. To take Nancy's as class. Yeah. And Nancy called me uh, a couple days ago and said, "I'm a little nervous about what I'm supposed to say." Like Nancy, just talk about your class. That's all you have to do. That's right and you'll be good. So Nancy's gonna tell us about her class that again, all students are strongly encouraged to take. So we still teach this stuff. Please, Nancy. We do still teach this stuff. Hi, I wanna say a couple of things. First, that I am a proud double, double alumna of the school. Mm. And I have been teaching this group work course here since 2003. And the reason I wanna underline that is to say that many schools of social work do not offer courses in group work anymore. That group work, uh, unfortunately, has fallen out of fashion. But I want to say that uh, I believe there's going to be a resurgence, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about why. OK, so having a group work course in a master's program in the United States is not a common thing, and we're doing it here. I wanted to use the same quote that Margaret did about, from Margaret Mead mm -hmm. about uh, small groups are the only thing that ever have created sustained change. So what we're about here in the course that I teach is giving students the skills and knowledge, and most particularly the skill development, to lead groups in powerful and positive ways. So on the one hand, there's the academic understanding and knowledge base that we need to create to support them in doing that. On the other hand, we really need to create, through experiential learning and through practicum experiences, the internal skill development to know what they're doing. And I was so inspired by Margaret's video because you could see that these people that she worked with not only were powerful advocates, but they were changed in the process mm -hmm. of learning those skills. So um, I teach in all three of the venues that we offer here. I teach in the traditional program, intensive weekend, and in the online program. And that is such a kick for me. I want to thank Sharon, uh, actually, for asking me to design that course for the first time and trying to think about how one does skill development in, in group work practice online is something fun to think about. Yeah. <laughs> and we're getting better at it, I think. Mm -hmm. So um, the technology has to catch up you know, with what we can do in a room with people. So, um, so in addition to the, to the knowledge, uh, we do a lot of skill development. Uh, every student in my class not only works in groups within the class, but they're required to lead, co-lead, or observe a group outside of the class. So they are really getting you know, the, the so-called hands-on experience in how one uses themselves in a way to influence group process and group activities. One, of an, one example is a school social worker who did take the course online, as a matter of fact, and she needed to have a group. And what's happened is the students are so creative that they have been creating groups in places where groups either didn't exist before or didn't exist in this way. So this school social work, and the reason she did it is because she was required, you know, the course required her to do it. Uh, so she noticed that there were some little boys in her school, a group of them, that were constantly getting into trouble. She got the list of names for the principals and she said, I'm, I'm going to do a group for these kids. And what she found out was that these disruptive little boys had one thing in common, which is all of them had absent fathers due to incarceration, due to mental illness, or due to being absent. I don't know what else to say about that. But what she did was she created this group for six sessions. Now, for the clinical people in the room, it won't take you long to connect the dots to the fact that these little boys who 
thought they were the only ones living in a stigmatized situation find out that they're not the only ones, that, they, that their buddies live in this situation. Mm -hmm. And within the group, she was giving them the skills and the connections and the support to manage themselves given their problem. At the individual level, each of these boys developed some skills in managing themselves in a group. At the group level, even after the group ended, these little boys in the third grade had a support group that's going to support them as they go on because they're not the only ones anymore. And so that's one example. Uh, we are teaching, although um, the course is weighted toward um, treatment groups, psychoeducational groups, and that sort of thing, I think it's really important that uh, students <coughs> learn how to manage task groups and how to run an effective meeting, mm -hmm. how to build an effective committee, how do you manage uh, organizational change on the small level as well as on the uh, bigger level because it isn't, many people think, not anybody here of course, but many people think that just because you get people in a room and around a table you have a group and you don't have a group yet. You don't have a group yet until there's a common purpose. You don't have a group yet until there is the capacity to interact with each other in a way that creates support for change and creativity in addressing the issues that come before them. And there are processes to do this. And that's what I think is so important that we offer them in this course. Um, one of another student in the virtual program was observing a state level group in her committee, a community. It was, they were planning to make something like a mental health paraprofessional. And the heads of the various agencies statewide were having meetings and they were having these monthly meetings to design what this training program ought to look like that they were going to implement in their community. And this bunch was in big trouble. And after months and months, they're flailing around there, you know, because nobody knew how to run a group. Mm -hmm. Our student, you can be proud of this, our student took a look at this and she said, you know, they don't have a common purpose. They have a common purpose, but they don't have a common goal and they don't have a shared vision about what this needs to look like. So our student moved from observer to facilitator <laughs> and facilitate you know, help them get themselves back on track to be more effective in the work that they were doing by sliding under them the supports and knowledge of group practice. So I figure she doesn't have to worry about employment once she finishes her master's degree. But that the idea of making sure those supports were in for that group came from her. Came from her. It's good work. Perfect, Nancy. See, I knew you would be fine, just as I knew Margaret would be fine. Just talk about your practice. So now we want you, you're in small groups at tables. Talk a little bit about how you use small groups in your practice, especially around issues of social change, but really anything, because I think what we're learning today is while some people are concerned that we're not teaching group work anymore at SAS, we are. I mean, you just heard it. We're still using this stuff. It's not dying out. And it's not dying out because people figure out it's very powerful stuff, and so they use it. So we'd like you to discuss amongst yourselves how to use some of the ideas we've been talking about today in your own work. And then we'll ask you to report out and otherwise ask questions, and then you'll be done. And that way, it has an educational component, so I've satisfied the CEU people. David, can I? Oh, and, and sorry, yeah. Mark wants to. I want to give uh, the voice of Grace Coyle even further in here. And so Grace talked about uh, or wrote about some basic assumptions about group work. So as you think about applying uh, this lens to your work and practice, think about these four assumptions. Number one, group work provides an opportunity for intimate relationships that help in the maturation process. So they help people mature and become 
uh, a better uh, functioning adults. Number two, it's a preparation for active citizenship and democracy, and Margaret's work uh, in the video showed that so well. Whether it be self-governance, whether it be addressing social issues, whether it be dealing with conflict and differences. So the preparation, second one is preparation for active citizenship in a democracy. The third one is it's a corrective for social disorganization, mm -hmm. whether it be uh, youth that need to learn pro-social behavior and norms, or whether it's a culture of an institution or a coalition that doesn't know how to, to get organized together. So a create, it's cor corrective for social disorganization. And the fourth, it's treatment of intrapsychic maladjustments, is her language. So, uh, which is more what we think about in terms of treatment. But, uh, so those are the four things that Grace presented our assumptions behind group work. It might be interesting to think about those. Okay, so to add to your homework, think about how you use groups in your current practice. Think about how you use groups to help people become more mature. I used to chair the faculty meeting, so I'm familiar with that. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> just sneak that in there. Um, work in progress. <laughs> Um, uh, how you use groups to help people think about their role in democracy yep. and, how, and how you use groups to counter social disorganization, which reminds me of one of my online students. I want to brag, too. Okay. So I had an online student, right, right. and he was at East End Neighborhood Center. I was like, that's kind of interesting, which is one of our local settlement houses, he's, but he's an online student. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. What's this going to be like? So for my class, you pick a policy that is very counterproductive, and you spend the semester trying to change it. Mm. So this is a guy who works in settlement houses um, in the Buckeye Shaker neighborhood. If, if you're ever driving down Shaker Boulevard, you'll see East End Neighborhood House pretty prominently there on, on the side. So he picked, my topic is zero tolerance school policy. So I said, perfect topic. So, you know figure out why that doesn't work. And, and I, didn't, I can't take credit for this. He decided to form a group with the kids, kind of like your story. He decided to get them in a room talking about why they misbehave so that he could prevent them from doing something that would then get them kicked out of school, which you know, once you're kicked out of school, it's sort of, you know, well, I don't have to tell you, it's kind of stupid to kick a kid out of school for misbehaving, because then what? They misbehave. Um, so, and he made a video of this, so I can show that. I don't have that with me today, but next, you know, he made a video of the kids in their group talking about their troubles and why that makes them act out and how they kind of share their experiences so that they don't show up at school and, t and take a swing at somebody out of frustration because they have another avenue for getting it out. Okay, so it's how to use groups to correct for the social disorganization that's all around us to promote democracy, and to help people become more mature. Among other things, how to use groups in your day-to-day -day practice, because I'm sure you all do use groups. And then we'll come back in a few minutes, and you can share what you talked about, and you can ask us any other questions. Go for it. And then when you fill out your CU, say, well, I learned about how small groups are still used, for example, in these domains. And my right. table mate gave me these examples. and. Anyway, so thank you. We'll come back in a few minutes. So talk amongst yourselves. Hopefully you know how to make a group around a table. <laughs> All right, we're going to now have you report out a little bit. We have a microphone over here. If you'd like to share a little bit about what you've been talking about, raise your hand, and Leah will hand you a microphone. All right, we have a group here willing to start. All right. We, we are all on, on the faculty at the Mandel School. We were talking about other ways we use group process, which is in student interest groups, student clubs, and activities, and uh, how that it meets not all of um, Grace Coyle's four points, but many of them. Mm -hmm. And we see them taking their interests and using the skills and then moving things forward. And it changes every year and all the time, and it's exciting. Good, good. And I was also in a group of faculty, and so we talked about, well, admittedly, we no longer have the group concentration, but actually it's better this way. Now they can concentrate in different things, and we can infuse groups across all the different areas. So if they want to work in substance abuse, they can do that, and they can be concentrating in that, and they can be strongly encouraged to take the group work class. 
or if they want to work with children, that's fine, work with children. Uh, but you will be strongly encouraged to take the group work class. And in your free time, you'll be doing small group work with your classmates. So group work is alive and well at the School of Applied Social Sciences. I feel confident I can say that. And I'm, I'm glad I can say that, frankly, because Anna Fritz really was honest to make sure that was true. All right, so can we have that table maybe? Report, oh, let's have our Anna Fritz uh, scholar recipient Tell us what her group talked about. Yeah, we all talked about how we do group work at our different agencies. So coming from either like running meetings and figuring out what the agency needs um, to combining maybe spiritual needs with other things that um, the agency or the, pe the population. Um, I talked about that right now, my field placement and my um, job, I'm working with group works to help make permanent connections for kids in foster care. So when we're done with them, they still have someone in the community that they can come to, be it like the LGBT group or something, just so that they're connected. And so that's what we try to do is to help these kids who are needing to learn skills and needing to learn how to be on their own. So we have these groups that meet and <clears throat> kind of bring in different um, Great. Community resources. All right, can we have the maybe Joy or Sarah or John or Margaret talk about their table? Uh, what I told uh, Margaret uh, early on was I've always done group work. And right from the beginning, uh, I was doing group work and I didn't know it. And, yeah. and, and I just listening to uh, Margaret, today, I realized that my whole career was group work. That's right. And, uh, and so it's just, it's very exciting for me. I'm currently, as I said, I re I'm retired um, the third time. I retired the third time and I'm back to work again. And uh, so I'm working, we're working on the opiate uh, epidemic and uh, working some direct service, but it's group again. Yep. And, uh, and uh, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Sarah because she had some good ideas. I have what? I have, I have no idea what she's referring to. <laughs> we'll get her to and, write it down before and, and she I, leaves. I, so. Yes, I guess. And I, I defer to her because I'm faculty. And I, I use small groups in my teaching um, is where. Is that, was that it? Yes. And, and that's where I'm primarily using them. And I've had a number of wonderful small group experiences in my own life. So yeah. thank you. That's right. All right, maybe uh, uh, Marcia is kind of queen of Cleveland in many ways, I'm sure, uses groups. No kidding. Yeah. No kidding. Oh, I won't claim the title, but thank you anyway. <laughs> Teresa and I talked about how she was inspired to think about how she could do uh, group, small groups in the nursing home she works in where she does mental health with individuals. And so we talked about some of the details about that. And I was recounting my experience as a, uh, in the early part of my career as a, an individual therapist and in the height of the divorce uh, increase, I started doing groups for women in the process of divorce, which then morphed into people in the process of divorce. And then we did parents and children in the process of divorce. And, um, for a while, that was an essential thing for the community. And we knew it wasn't essential anymore when we couldn't recruit groups anymore. Um, and now, I'm, now I am in my 14th volunteer role as uh, a member of Greater Cleveland Congregations, which is a group organizing phenomena. Um, and, and, and don't forget that beautiful building next door that you raised a lot of money for, probably with small groups. Yeah, I we, would did, guess. we did use small groups to do fundraising for the renovations of the building. That's true. I didn't think about it at all, but yeah. Yeah, see, groups are everywhere. Everywhere. You just so, don't notice. So, Anna, relax. We're still doing it. Of course we are. You can't be, basically be human without doing it. All right, let's have that table there. Hi, good morning. I was reminded that... Uh, Part of my degree in social work was in group work, and I had worked with, uh, had a wonderful instructor in Ed Jenkins, 
mm. who yes. provided much structure. Before that, I, w I was doing group work on the fly in residential treatment. It was my uh, trial by fire. Uh, but I had, I had good supervisors in residential treatment, and we did set up a structure for uh, children for goal setting. There always was a group, uh, but really to, to reach the children, uh, we went into subgroups and uh, were very successful and effective uh, with the children. Uh, you know, following that, uh, field placements and groups in the community, uh, in uh, correctional institutions. Um, for the past 20 years, it's been a different kind of group work, uh, working in hospice, mm -hmm. uh, in the community with families to develop caregiving because most patients wish to stay at home uh, and with their family. So developing a core of caregivers uh, means working with the family, a la the group. All right, great. Does anyone else from that table want to chime in? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Mama Dusek, uh, I'm the chair of the International Association of Social Workers in Ohio, in Northeast Ohio. We have a chapter of that organization in Ohio, and Anna has left us a lot of money to do the work, to really enhance group work in, this, uh, in Ohio. Uh, our organization's mission was to, was to uh, develop social work with group in universities, uh, targeting universities to make sure that group work is in the curriculum. And we have succeeded at least at Cleveland State, right now we have two groups of uh, two courses of group work that are being implemented, uh, that are in the curriculum, and I designed them. Uh, what we found out was uh, we did a research. The, the organization did a research in Ohio and found out that many workers have never gotten, gotten any training in group work while they are doing group work. They do group work, but never gotten any training. So uh, we said, now we have to work on this, make sure that universities uh, you know, integrate group work in their curriculum. And that is what uh, we got here, because we found out that Alan uh, has been doing group, has done group work without training. And it's only by getting a, 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 a seasoned uh, trainer, a seasoned teacher in group work that he got involved in group work. Okay, Thank great. You. All right, maybe this table here. Okay, so, um, okay, like that. All right, um, I'm Robin Caldwell and I'm from the class of 86. Mm -hmm. MSSA, so I can't believe it's 31 years, that's crazy. But um, my, my thing was the group work that I did, I'm a medical social worker, so it was in a clinic setting and it was, i part of the opiate task force and this is in Akron, Ohio. And so we had um, groups for women that were in recovery, they're pregnant, but they're in recovery from heroin and they would um, learn how to take care of their babies. So that was, I mean, there are different goals for the group. And I, I think about the things Margaret was saying, how you might have had one certain goal when you started it, which would have been educational, but as time went on, there were other things that happened and the people in the groups, the women um, developed relationships and there were different things that we worked on that we could provide for them in the clinic. And we, we had other groups too that were for um, the refugee families um, from Nepal and Burma and we were teaching um, safe baby practices like um, not sleeping with the baby, being sure the baby is in a safe place. And um, so it was educational basically, but 
we did other things with them too, and, and they could come there, and the WIC worker was there, and um, the legal aid person was there, and the doctor, so they could get everything taken care of at one time and in one place. And um, the other people in the groups had some things too. Um, do you wanna talk, Marlisa? Sure. Um, my name is Marlisa Lewis. Um, I work for Calhoun County um, in Jobs and Family Service. I do like workforce development. I work with individuals that's on TANF assistance. So we do a lot of focus groups to try to determine what programs will work for our clients to try to help them get some form of training or jobs to help them become self-sufficient. Some kind of training or jobs to help them become self-sufficient um, to try to wean them off public assistance. Um, and this to provide them with additional resources that can better help them. Okay. All right, so maybe we'll do this table and then we'll ask John Yankee to come up and play substitute dean. <laughs> I mean, you know, stand, what do you call it, dean stand-in? Good morning. My name is Gary Incarvaya. I'm from Toledo, Ohio, graduate of 1992. And uh, I also had been taught by Ed Jenkins, and I see a couple of familiar faces that I've had. Group has always been an ongoing process that I used very well. And uh, at the hospital, we had group therapy for years, and then they stopped paying for it. Now it's back. I was a warden, and we use group therapy, cognitive behavioral, regular. I now currently am the director at TASC, and we've added cognitive behavioral group just recently, anger management, domestic violence. We're having a sex offenders group added because they're now reimbursing for it. It's very uh, research-wise, statistically, it works. I'm on a committee to rebuild the jail in Toledo, Ohio, and the skills that I was taught, I use all the time, every day. Now the big dilemma is these other classes that I have uh, interns from, they have not been taught group process. I'm gonna speak to you about the book because I have to teach these new people. They're LSWs that are graduated from other universities that have never had group work and they're supposed to facilitate these new groups. I can't be in all the groups, so I have to figure out how to get them caught up to speed. So I'm glad to be here. And then my partner here, he's using group to get uh, a giant eagle replaced in his community where they closed down a shopping uh, grocery store and he's using his experience. He's just a new graduate from uh, this past January and he's using his group work to get uh, this, uh, another shopping center to be opened up in that grocery store. And then he's hoping to use his skills to also do uh, coaching. Great. Thank you. All right, well, thank you. This has been fabulous. I'm so grateful to Margaret for her <coughs> remarks. She clearly inspired everybody. And I feel like I've helped um, fulfill the vision of this lectureship for Grace Coyle, yes, who we didn't talk about a lot, but we talked about some. And it, I encourage you to look at Grace Coyle's work. I think you'll find it very much resonates with what we've been saying today. Um, so we hope you've enjoyed this session and we'd like to see you at other events. Please go to our website for current information about and, your, and see your emails about other events we'll be having. And pick up your CU certificates at the registration table. Lunch is served right outside this room if you're staying for the afternoon session. Okay, so are we, is there anything else I need to say or do? Oh. Okay, John, John Yankee, Emeritus Professor, is going to have some closing remarks. He looks like it's news to him. <laughs> he's, he's prepared. All right. I was just going to echo the same things that I think you just touched upon. Um, I'm not sure that you hit quite as strongly as I would about that great lunch that's waiting for you right outside the door. <laughs> On the way in, it looked terrific. But we do hope you've had a wonderful time this morning, perhaps met some new people, heard some reinforcement of ideas, learned other ideas. 
and we do want you, as was just said, to connect with our website, look at other events, take advantage of our library, become very much engaged with us. This afternoon, we're going to have another session. This one's about technology. Do we lead it, or does it lead us? And our speaker, I'm looking deeply into his eyes right now, Adam Roth will be with us, and we'll reconvene here for any of you who are staying for that session at 1 today. We'll see you then. Thank you. Enjoy.